I, I got a question for you. Are there any, now that you've been within the company, you have this position, are there any common stereotypes that you've found that just have jumped out at you that you're like, you know, I almost can't even believe like, this is, is this the way you think of people who are different? And I use the word different because I, I you know, I want to make this conversation a little broader. Yeah. Than, you know, like we just said, in, in terms of skin color, because yeah, it, yeah, it encompasses so much more. But are there, are there common stereotypes that you found? I think that one thing that's really interesting, regards, like you said, the wide scope of diversity we're talking about. I think oftentimes the majority is kind of like, I didn't know that there was a problem. Like, of course, of course, everyone is equal. Of course, everyone has access. Of course, any everyone can apply for a job. Why would you think I'm discriminated against you because of your name? Um, you know, I think that that's probably the biggest always like, hmm, OK, I'm like, yeah, no, pe- people don't believe like it's that, not reality. That, like it doesn't happen. I'm so happy you brought that up because that they don't see themselves. Yeah. And, 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 and I have to believe in my heart of hearts, these people are not raging racist. They're not thinking yeah. that they are biased. Mm-hmm. And to hear you say one of the most common stereotypes that you found is them scratching their head. You know, like I didn't even know it was a problem. that is the problem. Yeah, yeah. No, I think people truly believe, they're like, why wouldn't you have the same access and opportunity as me? Like, it's not, the only difference I think maybe someone would say is like, oh, well, I have maybe more work experience than you do or whatever. And that's really like the only difference. Like I'm more of an expert. So regardless of what, however you identify, whatever it is, I'm just more of an expert in in that role or in that in that skill set, and they really just leave it as that. And 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 it's interesting because when you when you start to share, which is also is really important, we share our stories more. When you start to share, then it's like, oh, like you experienced that, and that's happened to you. And people think that. And really what it is, Sean, is that we're actually all living in our own little bubbles of some sort, right? And the bubbles that we live in is really what's creating these unconscious biases and and stereotypes and judgments or whatever we want to label them. And I think that people need to, um, there's so much power in just storytelling and being able to share more. But I I think that's probably the the main thing that stands out, Sean think of another example, but I think that that's really always what it is. It's like, oh no, or, or, okay. Another thing may be, it's only a small subset of people that have an issue, right? So let's say if we're thinking about underrepresented group and underrepresented groups make up 60% of the organization, out of that 60%, only 5% of people really have an issue. The other 55 actually love the company, love the work, love what we're doing, feel like they have opportunity. Feel, and I think that that's another thing too. I think sometimes we, we try, we, they try to make it much smaller subset of people and not realizing that maybe those people just happen to be the more vocal. Correct. But the rest of the people still want the access opportunity and, and everything and representation. Yeah, you know, even as you're talking, I sit and I think um, we all know the Central Park Karen. Um, you know, white woman walking her dog, black guy asks her, put the leash on the dog. She calls the cops. Mm-hmm. He's threatening me. You know, I feel threatened, which we all know as black men, that is, you, you, you're pretty much putting a death sentence out on me saying as a white woman calling the cops and saying a black man, an African-American black man is threatening me. I'm afraid. Yeah. But in, as, as that story was unfolding, it came to light that this woman, she was an executive, mm-hmm. high level executive. Yeah. And she said out loud, I'm not a racist. Yeah. And, and it always concerns me maybe in her head she doesn't see herself as such but you damn sure pulled that white privilege card when 
you was calling the police. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and but these are the other, these are the people on the other side yeah. of you being hired, you moving up in a company, you being able to even have a voice within that company without feeling like I'm going to get my pink slip. Yeah. So, there's so much work to do. And like I said, even as I was, you know, getting more into that case, you know, this woman is adamant about, you know, she she has black friends. She she she's, you know, not a racist whatsoever, um, yeah. which was astounding to me. Yeah. And I think that I think even that video probably also opened up the eyes for um, other white men and women as well um, to be like, oh, wow. Like and even probably think to themselves, have I ever considered a black man to be threatening me for doing or how am I reacting? Right. I think it kind of opened their eyes up to how do you react? But but that 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 particular situation was it it was very eye opening and, and it did speak a lot about. Um, privilege and escalation and, and, um, you know, and judgment a lot too. Um, and, and, you know, and we watched it and, and the guy sounded like he was just simply axing, you know, so it's just, you know, but let's, it's the let's be more right? Like what is, what happened to her before or what has she seen for her to immediately feel like it was an attack? And that's really, again, if we tap him back to the core, that's like the issue. Truth be told, I don't even know if she felt attacked. Mm. I, I, I personally feel it was just privilege. white privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How okay. dare you? You yeah. you have the audacity to confront me. Do you understand who I am and yeah. what I can do to you? How I can ruin your life? And here's the the, the kicker: she could not have picked a a. a a better representation from our community. This guy's well-educated. You know, he works as, as an editor or something for Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. He is gay, like th- th- a dog lover. He's in a park himself. Yeah. This, this guy's the most unthreatening guy out there. And because of, you know, maybe, I don't know what it is that she's seen or, or I, I just believe it was that privilege at play. And I know yeah. If it's happening outside the office, it happens within the office. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me if these names, you know, before we conclude, and, and I'm so enjoying this conversation. I don't get to have these types of conversations very often. So thank you so much for coming on and right. really being so open and and <clears throat> just sharing, helping to share with the audience uh, some of the different challenges you're facing in getting your job done. But I'm going to call off some names to you. Tell me if they are. Uh, Ring a bell. Okay. Because as I was doing research for, for this particular interview, you know, something occurred to me, but I'll read off five names to you. Okay. Kenneth, Kenneth Frazier from the company Merck. Um, Marvin Ellison, Ellison from Lowe's. Uh, Renee, Jane, Renee Jones from M&T Bank. Uh, Roger Ferguson from TIAA. And Jice Zeitlin from Tapestry. Do any of those five names ring a bell for you? I think the person from Lowe's and Jack from Tapestry, but I'm trying to remember why they ring a bell. Um, I think that they've been part, I've, I don't know if I've met them directly, but um, I think they are diversity and inclusion leaders of some sort. I'm gonna stop you there, (laughs) just in the interest of time. Who are they? As I was studying and researching for this uh, particular interview, I asked myself, how far have we really come? Mm. And I wanted to know how many black and brown CEOs are there in the Fortune 500 companies? And there's five. Yeah. Well, that's so much further. I think it's Ford. Well, Tapestry, he stepped down. Oh, Tapestry stepped down. Yeah. Got okay. From so we're, we're down, we're down to four. Down to you know, we, 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 we had Ursula Burns, who everybody knows from Xerox, Xerox. Uh, you know, first black woman CEO, and she stepped down in 2016 as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just Zero shows. black women. No, we have no black women. I named five black men. Yeah. And, and no black women. 
So it just shows just how far we have to go in corporate America. Before I let you go, I, I, I think you are necessary, mm-hmm. but my audience is full is filled with entrepreneurs. Yeah. Why have you never chosen to go the route of entrepreneurship? Mm, yes, yes. You know, I think for me, it's important to have representation in corporate. And I think you just naming the four black male CEOs um, that exist now shows that the representation is needed. And and I think too is entrepreneurship life is hard, but I, I think that I'm an entrepreneur as well, but I also lead corporate. And what we do is those of us in a corporate space, we're actually creating and, and trying to find opportunities for entrepreneurs and small businesses. What I love specifically and one of my biggest takeaways in working at H&M is the entrepreneurs and the small businesses that I've actually been able to bring into the company and create partnerships for them. And not that they couldn't get it on their own, but this was the first time that the organization has worked with these with these entrepreneurs before. And now they can take that and put it on their resume and put it on their company profile to show I've worked with this big global company which will open up the doors for other companies to follow. So I think it's like everyone doesn't have to be an entrepreneur. I think that I think that you can be an entrepreneur in your own right, but being a corporate leader, it it, it helps and it pushes the diversity that is very much needed and the representation that we need in order for us to create more spaces for other people. Because every single person in the world is not going to be an entrepreneur. So who's advocating for those that are in the corporate spaces? We need representation everywhere. So in entrepreneurs, small businesses, startups, corporate, everything, and including all the industries as well. And what I've committed to in my entrepreneurship spirit is to make sure that I'm creating programming and opportunities where I can bring in those entrepreneurs in order to create um, big contracts and budgets for them in-house. I just thought of something and I don't want to let you go before I ask this question. We've seen Colin Kaepernick who has now, Mm. you know, now he's, he's damn near iconic, the name Kaepernick. But years ago, he was slandered. uh, He was ridiculed for taking a peaceful protest, taking a knee peacefully protesting, something that under our constitution is his right. He lost his career behind it. So for anyone who is within corporate, what is the proper way, I don't wanna say to protest, but to bring light to issues without being ridiculed, without being blackballed, without without being fired yeah. for some other cause. Mm-hmm. You being on the inside now, how should somebody go about doing this, especially a person of color without looking like the angry black man or the angry black woman? Yeah, I think what, what Colin did, I think was remarkable. And he really um, put himself out there for change and his name will forever be part of history um, into where we are um, today and where we continue to advance to. You know, it's it's one of those things and I'm sure he, he, he I'm sure he probably kind of weighed it out too and and probably was like, all right, so am I gonna do this? Am I not? And and I think sometimes when you're making those bold statements when you have such a platform, you have to be prepared of what it may look like, you know? And and I think that but you have to feel and really believe that there is a bigger purpose outside of that. So yes, maybe his professional career and professional football has ended, but he is still very iconic. He is still getting contracts. He is still being spoken about. So his purpose has now outlived what he was going to be doing professionally. So it's such a big win for him. I think for, for, for those that are in these corporate spaces and trying to advocate for change. I think the the biggest thing that I've actually seen work is really um, you lead with grace, right? You, you lead and it's not about being um, combative. It's not about being um, disrupt. Well, you, you are to be disruptive, but it's not about being mad and being defensive. It's really about 
highlighting that there's an issue, being available to help solution against that issue, and then providing solutions as well. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.